Hello and welcome to the Corporate Facility Council's webinar, Aerial Data Solutions, Drones and Facility Management, presented by Sean Muter with Altitude UAS. I do want to let everyone know that they have been muted for audio quality and that this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box and we'll go over them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. The recording will be available on the Corporate Facility Council's website, ifmacfc.org. You may also access past webinars on that site as well. Again, that site is ifmacfc.org. I'm happy to introduce our speaker today. Sean Muters, the President and CEO of Altitude UAS, an aerial data solutions company based in Wichita, Kansas, that offers contract drone inspection consulting services. Sean holds a master's degree in aerospace engineering from UT Arlington and is currently pursuing an MBA from Wichita State. He has held senior structural engineering positions at Tier 1 aircraft manufacturers and has over 10 years FAA compliance experience. Sean is a Part 107 licensed commercial drone pilot and holds multiple certifications in infrared inspection. The recent advances in unmanned aerial systems over the past few years has inspired him to seek potential applications for the powerful technology. He is consistently pushing the envelope to offer value propositions to clients. At this time, I'm happy to turn it over to Sean. Sean, the floor is yours. Joshua, thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here today, excited about the opportunity to discuss a couple of my, my personal passions uh, to the group. My hope is that um, the group can have a, a takeaway from this that helps with, with their operations, give some ideas on uh, a couple of different things. As I said, a couple of my passions, one being aviation and then the other one uh, being data management. Uh, of course, that's an increasingly important thing in, in our technological age. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity from a data management standpoint and uh, definitely something I, uh, certainly I'm interested. You know, as far as the aviation side, uh, been interested in it from from a very young young age. Really got hooked going and seeing the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds. Uh, and and f first first goal was to become a pilot. Unfortunately for me, uh, blind as a bat. So uh, definitely limited my career opportunities there. But uh, definitely uh, a, a close second on being able to get involved in the aerospace in, in industry. Uh, really specifically focus on on structures and that type of thing. Uh, and then, of course, you know, a natural transition into drones for me, uh, being involved in the industry, having a good understanding of, of FAA regulations and uh, things, uh, things of that that nature. And, and really being able to combine, you know, the, the aviation with the data management, the data processing uh, has 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 been been great for me. So, like I said, my hope is today that that you guys can take away something from this presentation, help improve your operations, take away some ideas for creating some value for your organization. Uh, of course, as managers, that's what we're consistently looking for is opportunities to create value for our organizations. And um, you know what I will tell you based on on my experience specifically, uh, you know when I was had opportunity to do some some research. Um, one of the recurring themes that you see in some of the most successful researchers, you know, these guys that are uh, from MIT, from Stanford, from UCLA, uh, that are putting out this, you know, this novel research and really making big gains in their fields. Um, a lot of them are looking to other industries to see what they're doing, how they're solving these complex problems. And so naturally for, for, for aerospace, when you're talking about uh, rocketry and you're talking about uh, obviously you know manned aircraft and drones looking to nature is is a, a very obvious place to go look so that was really to me a, a big takeaway from from that experience was being able to look to other industries and see how they solve complex problems and uh, what type of value it can bring to your organization so hopefully today I bring a little bit different perspective and uh, you guys can take away something from that and hopefully create some value for your organization today. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and we'll jump into this presentation today. Uh, I will be giving an overview of some of the drone laws and regulations. 
uh, definitely important to have a, a, a little baseline understanding of that, especially if you're thinking about hiring somebody to come out and do services for you, or if you're considering it uh, on setting up internal operations. Uh, but really where I want to spend my time today is going over some of the applications for facility management. That's really the meat and potatoes of this presentation. That's what's uh, going to create the value for your organization, have a good understanding of, of where those opportunities are. And, uh, you know, definitely enjoy coming out and speaking to, to groups about this, especially in different industries, because there's always new ideas that come up and good questions that come up. So excited to see, it, you know, what, what comes out of this, you know, from a question standpoint to see if there's any thoughts on where the technology can be used. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the, the last part of this will walk into some operations management things, um, you know, important considerations when you're going out and you're sourcing drone services or you're setting up internal operations as well as going over some of the insurance coverage requirements, things like that. Uh, all important things from a logistical standpoint to understand, make sure that you're protected from a liability standpoint as well. Uh, and like I said, probably won't spend a lot of time there, but there is information in the PowerPoints that uh, if you're interested in digging deeper into, certainly uh, that'll be something that's that's provided and available for anybody that's interested. So as far as um, you know, uh, utilization of drones, uh, really drone technology became, started being utilized by the military first, as most people know, uh, and really goes all the way back to 1917 when the first drone was used for military application. Many people don't know that drones have been around for that long. Most of the, the drone information that we hear about are you know, some of the surveillance drones that the military uses, some of the strike drones, things like that. And so uh, really most of the application has been military application, although there has been application in you know, the last 15, 20 years in commercial spaces for very specialized type inspections. Uh, also for cinematography, you see them see shots in movies, everybody's familiar with that. But it wasn't really until say 2013 when a company called DGI put out uh, hobbyist drones that had uh, some, some great great uh, technology, good sensors on them, gave the ability for you know, the, the average person to have access to this technology. And once that happened, the FAA really had to start thinking about how they were gonna regulate this activity. Um, of course, the FAA's charter is to make sure that uh, you, know, you, can, you can have a safe national airspace, but uh, also to make sure that the technology can be implemented into our economy, can bring value to the economy. So. Uh, obviously, at that time, the FAA started really thinking about uh, how, how to manage this, and uh, the first first evidence of that came out in 2017 when they issued CFR 14 Part 107, which does cover commercial drone operations, and um, put out put out a rule for that, which goes over a, a number of different things, making sure that. Uh, pilots are operating safely. They know what they're doing when they're operating within the national airspace. They're not going inter to interfere with inter any other aviation traffic. And the FAA is serious about these regulations. Uh, so if you are using them for a commercial purpose, uh, definitely want to make sure that you're you're complying to the Part 107 regulations. There's a company in back in 2017 called Skypan that was fined. $1.9 million for 65 illegal unmanned aerial operations. And this operator was what the FAA would consider an extreme offender. Those operations were being conducted in some very restricted airspaces. Uh, specifically, some of those operations were conducted about around the Statue of Liberty. So not the typical offender, uh, like I said, would be considered an extreme offender by the FAA. The FAA historically is very educational. Uh, so if you're showing that you're trying to uh, demonstrate compliance with the rules and regulations, uh, of course, they're going to work with you. Uh, where you really need to be concerned is obviously if you have you know, certain type of incidents uh, that cause property damage, cause injury, things like that. That's where you know there's there's potential liability, of course, uh, and really, uh, and I'll talk about this coming up a little bit later in the presentation. Really, where the main liability lies is in the insurance coverage, because uh, the insurance companies will use Part 107 to, uh, to to get out of insurance claims, and so you want to make sure that you have good coverage if you are utilizing this technology within your organizations, or you're considering going out and hiring somebody, making sure that they're properly covered. 
Uh, so, so important thing to understand if you're considering utilizing the technology. So as far as part 107 goes, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time digging into all the specific rules and regulations. Just wanna kind of give an overview of it, provide some key resources to go look at if you're interested in it and making sure that you're complying, your organization is complying, uh, has a good understanding of, of what the rules and regulations are. But really there's three main things that the rule addresses. The first is airspace restrictions. So, uh, you know, with areas around airports where you have a high amount of aviation traffic, Obviously, you want to make sure you limit the, the amount of drones that are in that area. If there are going to be drone activity in that area, make sure that we want to be notifying the towers, things like that. So there's processes put in place to make sure that those are taken care of. The next part is the remote pilot certification. So to actually be able to be certified, you have to go and take an aeronautical knowledge test. There is actually no flight testing requirements involved. Uh, so there's some overview of that. And then the last thing that the key thing is the operational limitations. So these are things like how high you can fly, how far away you can fly, whether you have to keep the, the drone in sight at all times, things of that nature. Right. And um, so, as I said, I provided some some links and some resources here for you. Uh, one thing for, for those that are not really familiar with some of the FAA regulations and, and guidance, the FAA uh, obviously puts out the, the, the standard regulations and guidance, which I provided the link here. But of course, those are all written by lawyers. Some of the verbiage is kind of challenging to work through, uh, to look through. And, and so what they do is they put out these things called advisory circulars. And uh, what these are are documents that uh, give you uh, some examples of how to comply with the regulations. So it's more of a, a layman's document. It's definitely a good first source to go to to get a better understanding of what the regulations entail and then gives you examples of how to comply with those regulations. So uh, definitely a good thing to know, a, a good resource to go to, and I've provided, provided that here in a link for you. So as I discussed, Really what I wanna focus on today is the applications for facility management. And uh, as, as I've discussed, you know, the military has been using drones for, for a number of years and, um, you know, really become a, a dominant force because of, you know, our ability to, to control the air with, with drones and uh, obviously manned, manned aircraft. And so, you know, there's a lot of value with with, uh, with the technology and be able to, to take images from an elevated view. Uh, of course, you know, and, and what you'll see through this presentation, a recurring theme is, is roof, roof management. And that's one of obviously the, the most obvious ones for a number of different reasons. Uh, I think the main reason being that uh, roofs themselves account for a significant portion of your maintenance and repair budget. Uh, back in the, the 90s, the Air Force Research and construction laboratory did a lot of research on developing data methods, data-driven methods and methodologies for managing roofs. And uh, the main reason for that is because it does account for a significant portion of that maintenance and repair budget. I think some of the quotes from some of the studies that were done during that time were somewhere around 13% of your total, total maintenance and repair budget. So of course, you know, that's an obvious place to look uh, to utilize the technology to help us. And, and like I said, that'll be a continuing theme. Although that's not, you know, the only place you can develop value from utilizing this technology in, uh, you know, in your organization, that's one of the key, key areas. So we'll be discussing that a little bit, some data management approaches, uh, some of the different types of inspections that are valid, uh, you know, utilizing drones. So one of the things I want to talk about before we jump further into this is, uh, you know, just an overall uh, view of, of where I think um, thoughts about data are going, what it, we're kind of seeing in our industry. And what I'm seeing right now is I'm seeing there's kind of three, three different viewpoints on uh, utilizing data, right? So um, the, the first viewpoint is you have a lot of people out there that are data averse for whatever reason. So they don't want to take the time to, to look through the data. They don't want to process it. They don't think there's very much value in it uh, for whatever reason. I, and, and, you know, just to speculate a little bit on, on these individuals, of course, everybody's different. But, um, you know, we live in an age where there's a ton of information on 
on social media, you know, we're, we're dealing with this year. I mean, just the challenges of so much misinformation that's out there. Uh, and, and obviously people start to get overwhelmed with it and, and tends to put a, a bad taste in people's mouth about data misinformation, uh, you know, spending time to, to work through it all. Uh, I, you know, was reading through some things last night and just thinking about how much time you have to spend to really get the true story just because there's so much misinformation out there and people it's it's fatiguing it's exhausting so you got this group of people that uh, are, are are data averse and and don't want to use data to to improve their operations and bring value to the, their organizations and certainly that's that's not the not the right answer you know we we, we got to understand that we we live in a, a non-perfect world of data information but at the same time we've got to be utilizing it to, to to get better at what we're doing and then the other group of people are the, the I, I like to call them like the monday morning quarterback uh, lookers on data so they're always looking to utilize data to justify their decisions in the past and really that doesn't bring you any value all it does is just justify your individual position as managers we should be looking out for our organizations we should be trying to bring value to our organization so really uh, in the middle of those two are, are the, the people that are utilizing the data to, to to make better decisions and to drive better outcomes and with the understanding that we we don't have perfect data we don't have all the data to make decisions but when there's opportunities to collect data efficiently and easily and uh, cost efficiently we should be we should be doing that and we should be organizing it in a way that we can we can utilize it so um you know just kind of a general note on, on data on on what what i'm seeing even in my industry and uh you know definitely something to to think about as you guys are managing your facilities your operations so as far as, as drones go, this is a, a chart that we like to show to people to kind of give an overview of what the aerial data workflow is. And there's there's a common misconception with with drones, and, and I think a big part of this has to do with just the novelty of them and the, the widespread availability of, of drones. You know, you can go to Best Buy, any of your big box stores, and you can go buy a drone, and you can take it out and take a lot of pictures. and uh, but but then becomes the question, well, what, what do you do with those? How do you process those? And how do you develop value from the data? And there's a lot more that goes into it. And fortunately, there's some really great tools that allow us to, to process the data in a way that we can develop value from it. So, uh, and a lot of this has to do with the, the satellite imagery and the satellite technology that's been in place for, for a while. And NASA's obviously done a lot of research on you know, developing image st stitching, develop photogrammetry so we can develop topography data, things like that. So there's a lot of good technology out there from a processing standpoint. I got a lot of good software out there that is available to us, but that's a big part of this is taking that data and putting it into those, those software programs, um, going through and, and developing high resolution photos. As you see here, this is an image of a roof that's probably built of 150 or so photos. And so being able to take all that information, combine it down into one single photo, uh, obviously brings you a lot of value from the ability to, to do a more closer inspection, the ability to go back to things, just a situational awareness standpoint to be able to point out certain things that we need to go fix. Um, you know, also asset tagging is a big thing as well, being able to tag all your assets on an individual image. Uh, you know, interestingly, I had a, a interesting discussion with a facility manager down in the Dallas area, and he had mentioned to me that uh, they had a requirement within the city that they had to replace trees if they had got affected by a storm. You know, he said he, he's got some trees that are very, very large trees, and not only do they have to replace them one for one, but they actually have to replace the diameter of those trees. So, you know, he's got ones that you can't get your arms around and now you've got a huge insurance liability if you don't have those covered on your insurance. So what he was actually doing was actually going in and asset tagging all his trees and actually covering them under his insurance policy. And just, you know, just in case a storm came through and he had to go replace all those because it can be a very significant cost. And, and so, you know, there's, there's specific application cases like that. And like I said, anytime I get to talk to somebody about the technology, especially in different industries, you get to hear those, those things come out. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really where the big gains are made. 
Um, but just from, like I said, from a situational awareness standpoint, being able to inspect a little bit closer, obviously, you know, some, some great, great opportunities there. And then you start to get into your data insight where this is where you're making CADs and uh, we've got a little, lot of good software that can automate that. So looking at what the square footages on roofs are, uh, things of that nature, which as you know, when you bid out a job, that can be very significant if there's errors in what the, the square footage are on the roof. And uh, you know, if you don't have those blueprints or those that information on some of these older buildings, a lot of times you got to take take those for face value. And uh, if there are, you're off by five, six percent, that can be very fairly significant on what the cost of the replacement is. So being able to have that data cross check against the bids, it's uh, very valuable to have. But really, where you start to develop the the real value of the data is when you start to get it into your data repositories. You start developing databases with it. So uh, collecting information on uh, you know your roof or material system, things of that nature. Uh, you, you start to be able to analyze that data, prioritize your replacement, be really smart with your capital outlay. Of course, we all have to manage budgets and and so looking at where where should I be spending my money? Where is it most effective to spend it? And like I said, a lot of this is focused on on roofing, and that's one example. But there are there are certainly other opportunities for for using the technology. And like I said, I, I enjoy coming out and talking to different groups to to hear about different use cases. So one of the things I also like to do is go through some of the the sensor technology and kind of especially if the, there are specific applications for for the industry and obviously one of the, the the main ones that are used on drones and the most common one is a visible sensor and of course we're all familiar with those we've got them in our phones uh, everybody everybody has has those so very familiar to, to people but uh, there's a, a significant advantage in, in putting one of these sensors on a drone and that's because you've got the telemetry data on the drone itself so you've got your altitude you've got GPS data and with that data you can start to um, you know be able to develop scalable maps you be able to start developing measurements you use photogrammetry to do all these things be able to develop topo data 3d uh, developments uh, just for from a situational awareness standpoint is, is great um, you know understanding what you really have on your buildings uh, and where you have potential risk and liabilities and, and those type of things being able to have that data is is very valuable so as far as the you know, being able to collect data efficiently and being able to collect high resolution data, pretty significant uh, improvements on, you know, when you compare to what Google Maps outputs from a resolution standpoint. So you're actually able to, to dig in and really look to uh, individual lap locations on your membrane. You're able to look at uh, individual penetrations, things of that nature. So uh, very, very good resolution, very quick data collection that, you know, this is an image that's built of probably 150 images, probably takes about 30 minutes to go out and collect that, uh, pretty automated process to go do that uh, and and spits out some, some great, great data, uh, great ability to look back on, especially if you, you go out in a roof and you inspect it and you forget about where something was or, uh, if it was really damaged in that location, you can go back and look. So definitely a great opportunity to do that and store information on, on your buildings and on your roofs. Great, obviously, for going in and inspecting vertical infrastructure as well. So towers and things of that nature that normally you'd have to get a boom or you'd have to uh, climb or, you know, uh, from a liability standpoint, eliminates all that. And you're able to go out and collect it very, very quickly and efficiently. So I mentioned photogrammetry. And, and the advantage of putting on drone, you know, sensors on drone platforms and the ability to take that telemetry data and, and uh, ability to process the images in a way that we can get scalable data off the images. And as I've shown before, you can develop these automated CADs, develop uh, roof, roof areas, develop perimeters, things of that nature, help you, uh, you know, cross check bids, uh, very, very useful, useful data. We won't spend a lot of time here, but um, infrared sensors, there's a number of different sensors that are available. Uh, the, the most common ones you'll see on drones are actually long wave frequency sensors. 
Uh, these are good for doing moisture inspections on roofs. Uh, the other common one you'll see on drones is doing near wave uh, as a near wave sensor. And, and those are mostly used for crop management uh, using, you know, looking for areas that need more watering or they, they've got, um, you know, a, a, a pest in infestation or something along those lines. And those are the most common ones. The mid wave and the short wave imagers, those are typically used for gas inspections and, and things of those nature. And those actually require nitrogen cooling. So the sensors themselves are just naturally quite a bit bigger, require a bigger platform. Don't see as many of, of those. And, and like I said, very specific applications. So the ones that, um, you know, are, are, are probably more specific to facility management is, is the long wave sensors and like i said that's because we use them for infrared inspections on roofs which kind of leads me into uh, a discussion here on infrared inspection so most are probably might be familiar with with the technology here really using infrared for inspecting roofs was first implemented in the the 80s and the air force had a big hand in that and and that's pretty uh, pretty natural just based on the fact that they do have sensors aboard their aircraft. So likely at some point somebody noticed, hey, there's uh, anomalies that are showing up on these roofs. Why are they there? And that started to get investigated further and started to show us that it's a great way to look for interior moisture within roofs. Uh, and since then, uh, infrared inspection has become the preferred NDI roof inspection method. Of course, there are other NDI inspection methods out there, capacitance testing, uh, nuclear density, uh, things of that nature, which some of, some of the facility managers might be aware of. Uh, but of course, you know, from uh, infrared uh, technology perspective, it, it is great technology and uh, it really gives you a, a great overview of the entire roof and allows you to go in and 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 do more targeted repairs and uh, definitely a lot of a lot of case studies that I'll I'll run through on that technology. Um, you know, of course, from doing an aerial inspection, it is very expensive. You got to pay a pilot, you got to pay for gas, you got to have a commercial aircraft to go up and do these. So really, it's it's more cost effective for very large buildings or multiple buildings, uh, mul uh, high high square footage. You're talking, you know, in the range of over 10,000 square, and so definitely. Um, you know, so, some opportunity there, but definitely got to consider the, the the cost to to value proposition there. Uh, what we do see is we see handheld inspections picking up during that time as well. So people actually getting up on the roof, walking the roof. And this is obviously more cost effective for some of the smaller, smaller buildings. Uh, but at the same time, you're not getting that overall elevated view of the building. So you're just getting snippets of the roof here and there. Typically what these guys do when they go up and they take uh, inspections, they go up there with spray paint, outline the areas where they suspect that they're they're damaged, they'll take core samples or they'll do moisture probe or capacitance, you know, follow up surveys at those locations. And then, of course, you utilize that data to make targeted repairs. Uh, but, you know, with the with the advance of the drone technology, now you can put these sensors on a drone and you get the cost efficiency of going and doing a handheld inspection. But you also get the overall view and, um, you know, the, the nice perspective that you get from doing an aerial inspection and and just in terms of cost you know um, what what i'll say about drone cost versus both handheld and uh you know doing an aerial inspection you know you're talking about fractions on the dollar of what it costs to go and, and do these inspections with a drone so definitely opens up a uh, uh, opportunity to a wider range of facility managers to go and, and utilize this technology and certainly can bring you a lot of value as you'll see in some of the next case studies that i'll go through So, uh, you know, as far as the, the inspection method goes, it is governed by ASTM C1153, which is a standard practice for location of wet insulation and roofing systems using infrared imaging. What this really entails is uh, two different types of inspection. First is a visible inspection where you actually go and document visibly uh, the areas that you're going to inspect so that when you take the infrared image later, you can go back and look at the, the visible uh, information, very important from an analysis standpoint to be able to identify areas where you've got structure that are interfering with your thermal patterns. Um, you know, typically the people that are doing the analysis are 
uh, need to be experienced, uh, understand, have a good understanding of roof systems, different roof structures, membranes, those that those of that nature. So if you are outsourcing, you want to make sure that they do have a good understanding of those things. They do have cert, you know, thermal certifications, and um, you know that they, they they they're knowledgeable about the type of inspection that they're doing. So if you'll see down in the left hand corner here, that's a HVAC unit which has some moisture intrusion, which is identified there. Talk a little bit about the physics behind how this works here in a minute, but just wanted to kind of point out some examples of areas that have been identified as having moisture intrusion. And what I'll tell you on that HVAC image right there is if you were to be standing up on the roof looking at that area, you would have no indication that there was water under there. So either that that HVAC unit's got a flashing issue or it's got a pan issue underneath or it's got a drainage issue that's causing that, that water to get into the membrane uh, underneath the membrane, uh, you don't know and you wouldn't really be able to physically see unless you did a real thorough visible inspection and you started filling some of the flashing. Um, and, and a lot of times those can be easily missed. So uh, you can see what the value of the technology is being able to see those locations. And one of the things uh, that I'll mention there is a lot of facility managers have over the years have put a lot of trust in their roofing contractors and naturally that's that's your expert right i mean that's the person that's going up there and uh, doing is supposed to know the most about roofs but at the same time you know we got to understand that the roofing contractors they're incentivized to do full replacements on roofs so uh, naturally there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there and uh, not to say that there's not a lot of great roofers out there and certainly there are very honest roofers uh, but what i'll say is just looking at the number of roofers that are uh, registered in the roof database here in kansas i mean you've uh, where, where i'm i'm from you're talking about probably 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 roofers that are in the database. So, um, you know, with, with all these roofers that are out there, there's definitely uh, some, some questionable things going on. And so the technology gives you the ability to really cross check what the information you're getting from, you know, your roofing contractor. And, and like I said, we'll go over some of the case studies and situations where the roofing contractor either just hasn't known that there was moisture, understandably, or you know they might have been pushing something that they shouldn't have been pushing as far as a re replacement standpoint goes. And really, uh, as, as most of you know, as expensive as roofs are to go replace, it's uh, can it can certainly bring you a, a lot of value, give you that peace of mind that you're making the right decision, that we're spending the money in the right places. And if you're able to spend this or save a significant amount of money on a roof replacement. Um, and, and instead of doing a roof replacement, go and do repair, then you can utilize those funds in areas where they're really needed. Uh, and, and based on you know, my experience going out and doing some of these scans, looking at the data from these scans, I have a hard time um, not believing that there's been a lot of roofing that's, that's good that's been just thrown away just because you've got a, an issue in one area and you've got interior leakage in one or two areas on a roof. Uh, and and we're continually seeing that as we're going out and we're doing these inspections. So as far as the physics go behind it, um, won't won't spend a lot of time here. But this is I think this is, is something that's important to understand if you're interested in utilizing the technology yourself, or if you're interested in outsourcing the technology, making sure that whoever is doing it does understand these things is actually out there at the right optimal times doing these inspections. So. The way the inspection works is uh, when insulation gets wet, naturally it has a higher mass. And uh, what that means from a thermal standpoint is that it has a higher capacitance. And uh, that's just a really fancy way of saying uh, how hard it is to, trans to uh, transfer energy to that, whatever that mass is. So areas that have higher capacitance, higher density, uh, it's harder to heat up or cool down those areas than the surrounding areas. And we exploit that fact and we're able to actually take images, infrared images of, of the roof at times where the roof is in a state of non-equilibrium. Uh, and those typically happen at times where the roof is cooling off rapidly or the roof is heating up rapidly, typically done right after sunset or as the sun is ri rising, heating up the roof. And you're able to see areas that have higher 
densities and that's what we're looking for and we're looking for those areas because those areas are good signs of moisture uh, as you can see in the image below there's an area next to that uh, second HVAC from the right there that has some saturated insulation and, th and that's the pattern that we're looking for um, uh, what I will say about this is that these inspections are heavily dependent on the conditions during the day as well as during the time of the inspection. So want to make sure that it's a day that's got good solar gain on the roof. There's not, uh, there's, there's, uh, it's only partly cloudy. Uh, if you got full overcast, you're not going to get as good results on, on from, from the inspection. And on top of that, during the scan, if it's windier, that window that I discussed where you're looking for that non-equilibrium state in the roof is going to be shorter. So uh, making sure that you're, Whoever's going out and doing this, if you're doing it yourself, you invest in technology that you understand you need to be out there at the right times doing these inspections to get good quality data. Otherwise, you're going to get you're going to get flawed results. So candidates for this type of inspection. So there are a number of roofs that are qualified candidates for this type of inspection. There's a number that aren't. Uh, the main one, obviously, that uh, roofing contractors are pushing right now is TPO. That's one that you can do this type of inspection on. PVC, EPDM, single membranes, you can do inspections on mod bit, built up roofs, uh, as well as SVF systems, you can do this type of inspections on. The areas that you want to be cautious of and stay away from are heavily ballasted roofs. Uh, those areas, because the ballast can can congregate in a uh, little bit more mass, as we talked about, what we're relying on is the density, which uh, if you have an area that's got more aggregate in it, it's going to have a higher density and it's going to show up warmer. So those are going to show you false positives, very difficult to work around from a thermal analysis standpoint. There are, there are uh, times when people have been successful with these scans where they've actually gone in and they've cleared out the aggregate from the area and done scans of the area of course you're putting the roof at higher risk there because you're you're risking penetration of the membrane that that type of thing so definitely something that you know i'd, I'd advise against but there has been successes in those areas it's just a little bit more challenging you have to know what you're doing you have to be careful when you're actually up there moving that rock it is labor intensive as well the other two that you can't do are asphalt shingle as well as metal roofs. So if anybody com comes up and tells you, oh, yeah, I can take a thermal scan of that, you should definitely be asking some prudential questions there because those are uh, not, not ones that you're going to be able to get any valuable data from. So this is a, a roof that was done uh, by a, a facility manager a few years back. This facility manager had a tenant that had two inches of standing water within their building and they were considering a, a replacement uh, of, of the roof. So they went out and did a scan to identify what the extensive um, impact was on, on the, the water intrusion. And uh, I usually ask people this in an open forum on what, what they think that that area was where they had two inches of standing water. And most people will get this right pretty quick. It's the 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 building section on the left there, which as you can see is lighting up pretty, pretty hot from a thermal standpoint. So this is one that was taken at night. So you are looking for that warmer thermal pattern, which those orange colors are indicative of that. What I'll point out with this image as well is if you look to the uh, middle of the image where you've got a large uh, damaged location, large suspected moisture location, you can see actually where the HVAC unit uh, it is probably one of the sources of that, that big water pattern that's kind of emanating out from that, that, that source. So um, definitely gives you a good, good visible image of where the damage is. And like I said, for a long time, you know, roofing contractors really, really held the key and uh, were able to easily pull the wool over people's eyes on it. But when you're able to go out and you're able to take this type of information, you're able to validate you know, the fact that maybe I don't have leaks in this area of the roof, maybe I should be questioning and replacing that section. And the fact of the matter is when we go out and we do these scans, uh, a lot of times, you know, the roof is, it's all consistent age, but some roof sections just naturally perform better than others for whatever reason. And the thing we've got to remember is you've got humans that are out there, they're uh, susceptible to air when you're doing your installation. So, um, you know, people get tired and maybe they didn't put that flashing in correctly or maybe they didn't do this correctly. They missed this step. 
so so and we find that there's areas that just they fail prematurely you've got more moisture that gets into the roofing system and that doesn't necessarily mean you need to go replace the entire roof and from a management standpoint you know i i i understand why that happens because it's it's easier to do it's easier to go and level set the roof but as managers we should be consistently um not asking what's easiest for us to manage, we should be asking what brings the most value to our organization. And managing roofs in that way is not not the right right method to manage roofs. You, you sh really should be managing them by individual sections. Uh, and, and really the, the data that we've collected, the information that we have really speaks to that. So as I said, this is kind of shows where all the damage is on the roof and as you can see on the left section there very very significant moisture intrusion actually um, you know once the moisture gets into the roof a lot of people think that hey this can dry out and this particular client had requested the roofing contractor install venting into the roof and um, <clears throat> been a number of studies on that uh, army resource uh, of army corps of engineers had done some research there and what they had found is uh, it takes up to 10, 10 or so years to actually dry out a roof. If you've actually patched it properly, you know you're, there's not continual moisture coming in. So once that moisture gets in, it stays there for a long period of time, which makes sense because you know a lot of times you've got roofs that got vapor barriers on them, things of that nature. And so the roof's designed not to let the water in. So once it gets in, it's very difficult to get out. And in fact, a lot of times when you go up there and you do a, a, a destructive test with a probe or something of that nature, you actually go in and you'll stick the probe in and there's so much pressure within the roof that the water will actually spray out of the roof. And uh, that's because, you know, you're getting vapor buildup within the roof. Uh, obviously, there are structural concerns at times, too, when that water's been sitting in there, degrading fasteners and things of that nature. Of course, the mold concern as well. Uh, so, so, and just from overall, the biggest impact is the more rapid deterioration of the roof. So if you've got an area that starts getting wet and it gets bigger and bigger, uh, you know, you're going to start having breaches in the membrane, getting blisters on your roofs, just because all that vapor buildup in there, getting wrinkles in your membrane, getting tears in your membrane, heat, you know, your thaw uh, freeze thaw cycles, things of that nature really starts wreaking havoc on the roof. So once that water gets in, it starts reducing the life of your roof and it's very difficult to get out. So one of the things I like to show is what does a good roof section look like? Obviously I showed you one that's pretty bad, that, that left section is a total roof section needs to be replaced completely. But you know, when we go out and do scans, uh, a lot of times clients are like, well, I didn't see anything on, on my roof. Well, that's actually, that's a great thing. You wanna see equilibrium on your roof. You wanna see very consistent patterns on, on the roof. Uh, what you will notice in this image towards the center around some of these HVAC units is that you've got some darker areas and what that is is that's just condensation coming off your your hvac unit that's um, you know just natural drainage that's happening on the roof and uh, so that's something that that you'll pick up that can become a problem if that doesn't have a drainage path but it looks like these have pretty good drainage paths to the scuppers and uh, so there's not really a, a huge huge concern there but um, you can identify those areas of ponding as well and those, a lot of times those are areas to to investigate but overall this loop this roof looks really good and uh, this is this is the type of image you want to see on your roofs. And if you there are areas that you want to go look at, you know, for for this roof and the right area, there is a little small area in the corner of that roof that I, I would suggest going in and looking at. But uh, those are the things that you want to see and you want to catch early if there are issues. And and it really gives you the ability to 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 refine in on the areas that you look on the roof. You're talking about so many so much square footage to go look at. Uh, if you have a map to go tell you, hey, this is kind of where you need to look and where you need to investigate, really reduces your inspection time significantly. So this, uh, this is a, a pretty good case study, kind of opens uh, everybody's eyes to the value of, of the technology. Uh, this was a, a roof that uh, the client had planned on replacing and so they contracted an infrared service to go out and take a scan to, to validate the suggestions from the contractor so that you needed to go and do a full roof replacement on this roof so the scan was done and um, <clears throat> there were some areas where there were known leaks the scan 
correlated with those areas were showing that there was some moisture intrusion within the membrane. The real key thing here though is the facility manager had mentioned that, hey, this, this north building right here, this is an area where I'd never have leaks, never have issues with, and my contractor saying I need to go replace this. And uh, common sense would say, well, yeah, the, these are the same age age roofs. You probably have problems with those areas as well. But as as you'll note, as we did the scan, there, there's there's no visible, uh, no infrared in, uh, information on the 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 moisture that's within the roof. So so that's that's really validating what his his knowledge was of the roof. The fact that that you don't have any any interior leakage in there is is really validating that and so from that he was able to save um, we estimated about one hundred fifty six thousand dollars on a section of roof that he was planning on replacing and if he hadn't done the scan he would have done it like i said that that's why i have a hard time believing that we're not throwing away a lot of really good roofing material that's performing well and like i said we see this on our, on roofs a lot of times where areas don't perform form well for whatever reason and like I said, we got to remember that these are in, these are installed by humans. They are subject to human error, and uh, th these things do happen. So managing your roof section by section can really save you a lot of money. You can use those those funds for something that's 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 needed more. And just from an environmental standpoint, all this this roofing material that we're throwing away it's it's very wasteful. It's damaging to the environment. Uh, why why would we do that? Doesn't make any sense. And what I'll say is when we do go out and scan these, typically only two to 5% of the roof area is wet. Uh, and so what that allows you to do is allows you to do the targeted repairs rather than go and doing a full replacement. And we all know the pressures of when a tenant or somebody, a stakeholder within the building, there's interior leakages, they're, they're yelling and they want you to go make a change and fix it. And uh, it's, it's an easy opportunity for a roofing contractor to misguide you on that. And like I said, I, I don't wanna say that every roofing contractor is bad. There are a lot of really good ones out there and that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, you know, you wanna make sure that you have the full picture, you have the visibility and then this technology gives you the ability to do that. So this was actually a, a gym floor that had a leak uh, in the roof that was identified as well. And uh, as you guys know, probably that have managed gym floors or, or gym gym areas, if, if water gets down on the floor, it can be a, a very expensive day. So uh, catching those early, being able to remediate those uh, is important. So a number of different other case studies here. This is based on a, a lot of research that was done by the US Air Force. Yeah, of a number of different inspections. And uh, what you'll note here, I've noted what the cost of the inspections were. Most of these were manned aerial inspections. And, and as I've mentioned, you know, doing a drone inspection is cost significantly less than, than going and doing an aerial manned inspection. But as you can see on all these, there's some pretty significant cost savings. Andrews Air Force Base did one uh, on, on a few of their buildings and they had a building that was targeted for replacement and they, what they figured out was they only needed to do a targeted repair on that $312,000 savings right so making sure that you're validating that uh, when you're ready to spend a significant portion of, of your funds of your budget of your capital outlay that yeah this is the right thing to go do and, and to go ahead and spend a little bit money, money up front whether you validate it or you you don't, you know, you're giving yourself the peace of mind. You're showing yourself that there, with, the, with these case studies that there's opportunity to save qu quite a significant amount of money. So uh, another another big one, Hill Air Force Base, and I think this was actually a handheld one that was done, three million square feet. And there was, uh, I think there was actually multiple buildings on this one that were targeted for replacement that or just needed, all it was was a targeted repair that was needed. So $700,000 they estimated they saved there. So very, very significant savings opportunities. And as, as we've discussed, the maintenance and repair, the capital outlay for roofs is a big portion of, of facility management budgets. So it's definitely something that you wanna spend some time on and, and, and um, put some resources to. So there's a couple other here, and I won't go through those, but you can take a look at those if you're interested in the PowerPoint. Uh, the next thing I wanted to discuss, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, discussing the, the Army Research Laboratory that 
had done a lot of research back in the 90s on developing a methodology for looking at roofs. And so we talk a little bit about the, the you know, going from a reactive state on your roofs to a prescriptive state. So a reactive is, you know, the firefighting anytime there's a leak, you're going out and they're fixing it. And being able to work up this to the point where, you know, you're you've got a database of all your roofing materials stored, you're you know what the warranties are and how to do scans to optimize that warranty, to catch them, to, to be covered. Uh, you're getting your roofs to last beyond 20 years and, and you're going up there and you're doing regular visible inspections. You're doing uh, infrared inspections as, as well. And, and on top of that, you're, you're knowing what material systems are performing best for you. So when you put all that data together, you're able to see all that and uh, that just helps you make better decisions for your buildings. So an, another neat thing with the technology that we have too is now we have the ability to take you know some of the the imagery and the 2D imagery even 3D in, imagery and we're able to incorporate incorporate that into databases. So for example, as what you're seeing here, you're able to manage these sections of the roof. You're able to log leaks on them. You're able to log repairs on them. And obviously this is just one example of a um, you know a, a 2D database implementation but it shows you kind of what the value is of it uh, shows you how easy it is to manage and how easy it is to look through these areas and then of course in your analytics looking at areas that are you know have higher percentages of moisture in them it allows you to start prioritize your roofs and that's obviously a great great opportunity to be able to do that from a capital outlay standpoint So this is a, a good case study. Uh, probably won't spend a lot of time here, but this is just kind of goes overview of, of two different organizations that have managed their roofs differently. The first one, University of New Brunswick, and the second one, the Combat Training Center, which used actually a predictive maintenance plan. The previous one, there was no routine inspection approach. And so what they utilized was a, a roof condition index, which is actually came out of some of that research that I mentioned before the army had done. And they looked at those roofs and uh, <clears throat> take a, took an inventory of those roofs. And what you'll see is for case one, those roofs, roof condition index deteriorated rapidly after 15 or so years. The reason why you're seeing that image down on the left only going out that far is all those roofs, that was the age of the time they went out and took, took uh, information, visible information on those roofs. But it just shows you how quickly those do deteriorate over time and, uh, and what the value of, of, of going out there and having a managed approach, doing visible inspections, doing infrared inspections. And there's more information on, on links here if you're inter interested in looking at those case studies. So running a little bit short on time, and as I mentioned, probably won't spend a lot of time here. Uh, really, you know, some, some key things here, especially if you're considering out going out and outsourcing or you're considering, um, you know, taking on, a new new division or having somebody manage manage drones in your your department a um, couple of key things to think about you know as far as what the level of experience is of the the person from an aeronautical standpoint is you know how well they are picking up new technologies things like that a lot of times we see or you know doing some consulting with with different organizations as we go out and try to implement these programs is these people you know, get really excited about the technology and or have got excited about it, but they haven't put really plans in place to, to implement it properly. So there's a lot more that goes into it than just going out and buying drones and thinking it's going to bring value to their, your operations. So, like I said, running a little short on time, but, um, you know, some of the, when you're setting up internal operations, really look into what are the highest ROI opportunities with technology. And as I've said, you know, roofing is obviously a big one because that's where you're spending a lot of your money. And uh, obviously there's some other ones from asset tagging, from doing vertical inspections, things like that. Uh, understanding how much time you're planning on committing to it. And you want to start with a slower approach to implementing slow. You don't want to just go all in, spend a bunch of money and uh, you want to take it a step at a time. And, and I think that's a common pitfall. So this was one thing that I, I really wanted to touch on and make sure that everybody understood. I mentioned it previously on, from a liability standpoint, making sure that you have 
the proper insurance coverage. So <clears throat> the insurance companies will fall in line with how the FAA considers UAVs. And the FAA does consider them as aircraft. Uh, and with that, you need to make sure that you do have a specific policy for, for drones themselves. Uh, and, and like I said, this is where there, there is a, a significant liability risk. If you do have some type of incident, somebody is injured by uh, your, your operations, you wanna make sure that you have the proper coverage. So uh, if that's something that you're utilizing technology, that's something that you don't have, it's definitely something that you wanna investigate to make sure you got proper coverage. Coverage is not very expensive. So uh, it's definitely uh, a good investment to invest in. So this was a, a survey that was done in 2015 on what the risks were. Uh, with drones, we see really uh, some, some very big advocates for it. And then we see people that are very against it. <clears throat> the big reason people are against it is, is obviously the invasion of privacy. Uh, concerned, and, and that's really where the risks were identified here. But obviously, bodily image, property image, are all are ones that are come up as as important as well. <clears throat> so I, I do have some more information in here on organizational policies, setting up internal operations, some training information as well operations, procedures, things of that nature, that if you're interested in this, you do have your current operations. Uh, it's definitely all good information to have. So, um, like I said, that, just going over some of the pitfalls here, you know, getting, having inadequate planning for, for setting up your operations, inadequate training is a big one, getting into things too quickly, you know, you should you should be starting off gradually and you should be documenting your lessons as you go. Uh, and, and like I said, focus on the high ROI missions. So like infrared and moisture inspections, uh, you know, looking at obviously com your commercial properties. So and then there's some more information on platform selection in here as well. I'm not going to go into these in depth, just kind of uh, informational purposes for anybody that's interested in, in the PowerPoints. Just goes over some of the common platforms here that are used, what the advantages of those platforms are. Um, and uh, so the, all that information is there as well as there's some information about post-processing software as well. Uh, and like I said, there's some really good software out there right now that pretty user friendly and it's easy to, to, to start getting some value from your data if you if you use it. So with that, I'd like to really open it up to any questions that, that you guys have on the presentation today. I'll be happy to field any of those. Yes, we do have some questions here. We'll try to get through them in the time allotted. The first one was if the slide deck would be made available and yes, I will get a copy from, from Sean and send that out later on. Um, another one is, should the infrared inspections of roofs be done in the evening when the roofs are cooling? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. And uh, my opinion on that is yes, although there are some experienced thermographers that have been successful doing it in the morning. The, the big difference there you run into when you're doing it in the morning is you've got the interference from shadows. So obviously, if you've got a shadowed area, that area is going to show up quite a bit cooler. And uh, when you're doing it in the morning, you're actually looking for areas that are cooler uh, in reference to the rest of the, the roof. So, you know, it, it, it certainly starts interfering when you're seeing shadows that are showing cooler. So uh, it's it's definitely something that uh, I would recommend against. But there are thermographers that have been successful doing it. And I think most of those thermographers are, you know, guys using handhelds out there that have a little bit more. Uh, ability to take take images from different angles and things like that get a little bit closer so you can do it but it's it's not something that i would i would suggest doing especially if you're not really experienced with the technology okay i would be interested in recommendation of drones and cameras along with budget estimates and a good source for purchasing sure so i do have a little bit of information in here on that um <clears throat> you know as far as as drones go I can go back here a couple slides here so you know as far as as the platforms go DJI is the probably the most popular uh, 
drone provider manufacturer. They are a Chinese company. There's been some concerns in the last couple of years on data security. So if you do have sensitive assets, probably uh, there's probably some other better suited applications for you, other suited platforms for you. Now, DJI from an overall use standpoint, getting up to speed if you don't have any experience using it, are probably the best. Um, anybody that's that's somewhat familiar with drones does know about DJI. All their drones are rotorcraft. Uh, any of these drones for visible inspections, the Phantoms and the Mavics are great for doing visible inspections, being able to get up on targeted, um, you know, targeted events or, or really what I should say is trigger events when you have a storm or something like that, being able to go up and take a quick look. These are all great, great technology to use, very cheap. From a cost standpoint, I think all this top technology is, you know, is going to cost you in the range of a thousand to two thousand dollars. So, for for what you're getting from being able to go out and look at things uh, quickly on trigger events, very very cheap and very capable. Now, you know, getting into some of the infrared technology, uh, there are some drones out there that do claim to have infrared capabilities. Most of those drones are uh, have sensors on them that are not radiometric, so you can actually look at the temperature, uh, which uh, and, and some of those drones have quite a bit lower resolution as well. Uh, probably some of the best sensors that are available out there that are reasonable from a cost standpoint uh, are uh, also made by DJI that has a collaboration with FLIR. Uh, which is really, you know, the technology and the company that the military uses on most of their planes is the Zenius XT, and and that that camera can range anywhere from probably ten to sixteen thousand dollars, depending on what what uh, resolution you want, what type of lens you want. And then the platforms for these are not very expensive either. I think you're talking most of the Inspires are anywhere from probably $1,500 to $3,000, depending on what, what type of, of drone you're looking at. The Inspire 2 down here has a little bit better camera capabilities. Most of the time, those are actually used for cinematography, videography type applications. The one above it is uh, really specifically built for inspection, so that's a, that's a good one. And then and when you get into the next category, these are really industrial type drones. So you have the ability to put on telephoto lenses and things like that. You have the ability to put on multiple sensors, and this is the Matrix 200 series here. And so you can put an infrared sensor on it as well as a visible sensor on it for doing inspections. A lot of these you're seeing used for doing electrical inspections and things like that, uh, depending on what type of, of um, you know, sensors that you put on these drones can run anywhere from fifteen to thirty, forty thousand uh, dollars, just to give you an idea on on pricing there. Are there any more questions?